Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome to our webinar on Lessons from the Bread Lab, Participatory Plant Breeding. Uh, we're super thankful that you could all join us today. I think this will be a really cool conversation uh, with a neat mix of people joining, too, which is exciting. I'm Sarah Preston. I'm the new Prairie Regional Coordinator for the Bout of Family Initiative on Canadian Seed Security. Um, I am based out of Organic Alberta and have been with them for a few years, so this particular role is new to me, but there's lots of familiar faces and names here, which is nice to see. Uh, I would like to share just a minute uh, to acknowledge the land we're on before we get started. Um, so, of course, we're all joining from across Canada, all from different uh, traditional territories and unceded lands of many different Indigenous peoples. I am joining from Treaty 6 territory uh, east of Edmonton. I'm on the edge of a Miswichi, which is the Cree name for the Beaver Hills, uh, and it's a place that I feel a really deep connection with. Uh, and that, that feeling always reminds me of Lakotawin, which is the Cree concept of kinship, uh, and it encompasses being related to human and other than human kin, uh, and especially of holding a responsibility to live in good relationship with those relatives. Uh, and whenever I talk to farmers who grow heritage and land raised varieties or bakers who are really excited about like just cool flowers and local grains, there's always this common thread of good relationship that comes up. So. I have a feeling a lot of you will kind of have some sense of this kinship already. Uh, and as we're listening to Robin's stories today, I just want to offer participatory plant breeding as an entry point into thinking about how we can decolonize our food systems and plant breeding systems. Uh, so maybe consider what Lakotoan means uh, and what, what it means to you to live in kinship with your food and the seeds and the land and the people who produce your food. So we've got a really diverse audience today. Uh, and some of you might be wondering what participatory plant breeding or PPB even means. Uh, PPB is an established methodology where farmers and plant breeders will collaborate over several years to grow out populations um, in working farm conditions. Uh, and prioritizing the farmer's expertise, um, as well as their trait selections um, and their goals. The work of plant breeders like today's speaker uh, is so important because farmer-led plant breeding is quite rare in our modern agricultural systems, where most varieties are now developed by professional plant breeders in lab and research farm settings. So PPB is one method of bringing more diversity to both the ways the varieties are developed and to the types of varieties that are created. And by making plant breeding more accessible, it empowers farmers uh, and democratizes variety development for ecological farming, uh, which is especially important at a time when access to regionally adapted and climate seed has never been more important. For the Bout of Family Initiative, uh, our PPB program started in 2013 as a collaboration between the University of Manitoba, the Bout of Family Initiative on Canadian Seed Security, a program of seed change, breeders at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and farmers across the country. And it was funded by multiple rounds of the Organic Science Cluster. So we've had about 100 farmers participate over the years, uh, and thanks in large part due to Dr. Martin Entz and his team at the University of Manitoba. We're so grateful for their partnership and all of the work they put in to foster this program uh, and support the producers who are involved. The U of M is no longer uh, able to partner at the same capacity, but their team is still offering limited support when available. Uh, and today, the PPB growers who've been involved are at lots of different stages of wheat and oat variety development. So some of them have completed several years uh, of selections on their crops, 
and are growing it out on their own farms or uh, for grain uh, for direct market. Some have offered it to the University of Manitoba to include in their trials or offered for variety registration. Some are continuing to select uh, and some are just happy to let this project go. And then still others are storing their populations until they're able to find the right mix of marketing channels or equipment for scaling up. Uh, some of the lines are, are quite exciting uh, and are showing really amazing potential. Uh, and we're lucky enough to get some data on their performance today. Uh, so Dr. Michelle Karkner is joining um, and I'm going to hand things over to her in a second uh, to share some of her research on how those farmer lines are comparing performance-wise, uh, as well as some updates from the University of Manitoba. Okay. So many of you will know Michelle already. Uh, she is a scientist and researcher with Dr. Martin Ensis' team at the of M's Natural Agriculture Systems Lab. She's been a core contributor to this program for the past few years while completing her PhD thesis on this material. Uh, and she recently earned her PhD, which is super exciting. So big congrats to Dr. Karkner. Uh, and I'll let you go for it now. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I scrolled through the participants' names a little bit, and I'm happy to see some familiar ones. So. Uh, hi. Um, so our group uh, has been working in the PDB program for a while now, and now that I've kind of come out of the um, the hole that was my PhD research, um, this summer we have the capacity to increase some seeds um, from smaller amounts to larger amounts because we have the equipment and we have some extra land, some more, uh, extra organic land. And uh, one of the services we'd be willing to offer is to increase the seed for farmers who are interested in growing the PPB genotypes on their own farms. Uh, and I wanted to present some of the data from my PhD research in order to give everyone an idea of how they performed for you to make an informed decision if you do decide to increase some seed on your own farm. So I'm just going to present some quick performance data if anyone is um, interested in seed increases. And I'll also go through a document that I shared with um, Sarah and Abir with Bauda uh, that would be available through them um, for you to have. And I translated a lot of these slides for anyone who's French um, on the call. I translated all these slides from Google Translate, so they might not be perfect, but uh, I tried. <laughs> so. The data that I'm presenting from my PhD research is when I tested a whole bunch of different genotypes um, across a wide range of environments. So our, our past paper was actually just dealing with Manitoba selected PVB genotypes um, and testing them under Manitoba locations. But this research, we really wanted to take lines from many different farmers across Canada and then test them under Western Canadian conditions. Um, and these environments were chosen because of the collaborations that we already had in place um, and the fact that they were on organic land. And then the checks that we decided to include were either cultivars that were extremely popular at the time. So for example, AC Brandon was really popular and now it's Starbuck, or they came from um, traditional organic breeding programs, or they did very well for us um, in past trials. So I'm just going to present height and yields just to keep it simple. Um, and then in the document that I had shared with about a team, it has um, a lot more information in there that I will go through. So this is the, uh, this is height. And so this is uh, 25 farmer PVB lines. And you can see here, we have the line here. So these are the checks um, and the 25 PVB lines. And the, so this is the height. And this was, this is averaged across 12 organic locations. 
And so in some cases when we had really low, like poor performance, some of the lines didn't get taller than 50 centimeters. And then when we had really high yield, we had lines that went over 100 centimeters. And if you want that specific detailed data, um, then just contact me and I can I can share that information with you. But in general, you can see that the farmer lines, they uh, were much taller than all of the checks. And then just to give everyone context, AEC Brandon here is a semi-dwarf variety. And so that's the average height that you would usually see under with conventional cultivars that are widely available right now. And we, from my research, we've seen that height and yield are inc very tight, very well co correlated with each other because obviously organic wheat has to compete with weeds. And so it needs that height to um, overshadow the weeds. So, oh, and I, another thing I wanted to mention was that a lot of times when I show tall height, people ask about lodging. And unfortunately from 2020 to 2022, it was generally dry conditions. And so we actually didn't see any lodging um but uh that is something to consider when you're choosing a, a tall variety is uh how much lodging you see on your own farm on average um and then maybe choose accordingly and then this is the yield and so you can see at the top we had quite a wide range of yield from seven bushels to acre and that was due to really heavy alfalfa competition and 60 bushels an acre. And that was at the University of Alberta organic research station where they have really high organic matter, very little weeds because they practice fallow um, and really high nutrients. And so that was kind of our top yielding environment there. So on average, across all 12 environments, we saw an average of 35 bushels per acre and there was quite the, the wide yield range is also because the environments played a much bigger role in this the yield variation than just the genotype. And I explored this in detail um, in some yield stability analysis that I actually think I presented last year to another PPB call. And um, that video is on YouTube. So if you want to look really deep into the environment and genotype interaction, that that video is available. But the purple bars indicate the top performers, um, uh, which in a lot of cases, it was the PBB farmer lines, which is really great. Um, another uh, concept that I wanted to introduce was the fact that a lot of the PBB genotypes also were, uh, had parentage that were either resistant to uh, orange wheat blossom midge um, or were able to withstand the pest pressure. And in 2022, we had a lot of pest pressure. Um, so obviously this is geared towards Western Canada because orange wheat blossom midge is a big problem for us, but it might not be for you wherever you are, but that contributed uh, quite a bit to the high yields. And so even if you're on the prairies and you're thinking about what cultivar to grow, I would consider choosing a cultivar that had some SM1 genes in it um, because we can't use um, insecticides. So uh, we did see that that played a, a massive role. Then the other uh, co uh, quality parameters um, and maturity that I didn't really graph, but I just wanted to give everyone an indication of how they did. So in general, they matured between 82 and 88 days. The protein, we had a wide range between 10 and 16%, but on average, the lines were between 13 and 14%. So very comfortably within the, um, uh, the requirements for bread making, according to the Canadian Grain Commission, 10% is really low. Um, oftentimes you have to blend, but usually between 12 and up, um, most grain buyers are really happy with that. Test weights were within the Canadian Grain Commission requirements and the seed masses were between 29 and 33. 
And that might be important for you because seed mass and early season vigor are, are um, correlated. So you might want to choose a variety that has a larger seed mass. So I wanted to also show the document that I shared with the Bauda team. Um, it's just the location, locations of where they were grown. And then this is all the parentage and I outlined in here which ones have SM1 parentage um, uh, in the cross. And then I wanted to include the biomass accumulation and height because oftentimes high biomass accumulation indicates better um, weed competition. And so that's really for, if you're interested, I thought more data is better than less data. So you have height here. Um, I provided a, a visual of the yield differences. And then I also provided the actual numbers of the grain yields um, and the analysis of variance. And then another way that I presented the yield was to look at the difference from the average yield in bushels per acre and also the percent of AEC Brandon, which is um, was at the time uh, one of the most popular cultivar that was grown amongst organic farmers, just to give everyone some context. I also included seed mass, test weight, and proteins. So, and then I'll share this again. So, if you are interested in having some seed increased, we would need to know what genotypes you're interested in, and, and you can get that handout from the Bauda team to see what we have. What is the minimum amount of seed required to independently increase the seed on your own farm? And then we would be able to know how much seed we would have to grow on our own um, research station and also how many farmers are involved. So then we would know how much seed we'd be able to redistribute, we would be able to distribute after one year or if you would have to wait two years. Because we're a research lab, we also we often deal with very small amounts of seed. Um, to us, five, six, seven kilograms of seed is a lot, but I know that in a lot of cases, everyone will need like 100 pounds or something like that, depending on what seeding equipment you have available, what your drill can handle and things like that. So um, we would like to know by April 15th, because then that helps us plan our, um, our land allocations. And, uh, and if you have any questions, please reach out to me. Um, at the University of Manitoba, and that's a picture of Dr. Martin Enns and I on my last day of my PhD research. So um, the next day we harvested. But yeah, thanks, and I'll take any questions if anyone has anything. If anybody does want to take advantage of that later, uh, would you prefer they contact you directly, Michelle, or go through me? Um, I think it would be easier to go through you and then by maybe a certain date, you can contact me. So. Okay. Sounds good. I will put my email in the chat then for anybody who's interested and I can connect you with Michelle. Okay. Sarah, it's Word. I'm not clever enough to raise my um, hand. Go for it. Um, one question from Michelle. Uh, I was curious, uh, there was some other nomenclature that that was with the different names and varieties of the wheat, mm -hmm. and it was like ABC or ABCDE and that sort of thing. Can you just uh, oh, yeah. let me know what that means? Sorry. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a bad uh, uh, slide explainer. Okay, let's see. I can go back. Okay, so... The the A's and the B's all are have to do with statistical significant differences, and I explain this in the in the little notion in the PDF that I made for the Bauda team. But essentially, if um, if there's two bars that have the same letter, then that means they were not statistically significantly different from each other. So if you have two A's then they were not statistically significantly different from each other. Um, and so you can see there's a lot of overlap between the different genotypes, but in a lot of cases, especially with, you know, a line that just says A, 
there's um, uh, a big yield difference between this one and AC Brandon, for example. So that's what that means. Sorry, I didn't explain it. Very good. Thanks for that. And congratulations on your PhD. Thanks, Ward. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks yes. so much for that, Michelle. That was very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, we will also send out that PDF uh, after the event for everybody. Oh, uh, uh, there was one question in there about the golden unicorn. Yeah. So the golden unicorn is um, a the uh, line that was at a high yield, but also good stability, which means that it performed relatively well compared to the other genotypes that were planted in different environments. And so I can share my, if I can share my screen again, I'm sorry. But um, I call them the golden unicorns because a lot of times in, uh, if a genotype yields really well, it's, uh, it also shows that it's very sensitive to better environments. So that also means that it didn't do so well in poor environments. And if you want more information, I encourage you to watch that webinar that's on YouTube. But the two golden unicorns were BL23AS um, and BL34SW. And so uh, BL23AS is actually, L AS is, stands for Allison Squires. And I think Cody Straza is on the call. I saw uh, his name. Um, so that's their farm. And then the second one, BL34SW, that one is um, uh, Stuart Wells in Swift Current. And so those two lines show that they had higher than average yield, but they also performed relatively stable across the many organic environments that we tested them under. Um, I think trying to think anything else I can share about that. Um, but the actual graphs and everything, I mean, if you want that information, then just contact me. But yes, those are the two golden unicorns uh, that I named in the last webinar. All right, last call for questions. I think that's good. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, I just have a couple little bits for you guys so that you can understand um, a bit of the context of how Bread Lab compares with Bauda's program, uh, and then we'll get to Robin. So Bauda's program uh, for PBB is now in transition since phase two ramped up in 2022. That means uh, the future is uncertain, as is common with programs like this, uh, but we're really hopeful and continuing to support this community as we look for new ways forward. Um, and that's part of bringing in speakers from other similar groups, as it's really exciting to see what other folks are doing. Uh, so in the US, Washington State University has been following a similar PPB model for their organic wheat breeding program. Uh, and today we'll learn about some of the successes and challenges they've encountered. One thing to note, though, is the regulatory environments in Canada and the US are quite different. So some of Bread Lab's approaches might need a bit of translating to fit the Canadian context. Uh, and most of that uh, will be around the way that Canada's seed regulations uh, are set up in such a way that it means PPB growers here are generally limited uh, to selling these crops uh, through direct marketing channels for grain and cannot sell them for seed. Uh, and we've covered these regulations at length with participants uh, in the program. Uh, so we have tons of great resources on that. Uh, and Rebecca will link some of them in the chat if anybody wants to learn more. Uh, and we really hope that learning from other groups will seed some new ideas uh, and inspire our farmers and food processors here uh, to engage with future PPB projects and the amazing heritage and farmer bread grains that are already available. Uh, so I'm gonna introduce Morgan, sorry, Robin Morgan, uh, 
Robin, if you want to get ready to pull your slides up, you get time for that. Uh, yeah, uh, so Robin, uh, we're very excited to have him joining us today. Uh, he grew up in the north of Italy, being exposed to the natural beauty of the West uh, and agricultural systems uh, of the East. And after working as a cook, to uh, he decided to develop his passion about food by earning a Bachelor of Science in Agricultural Sciences and a master's in organic agriculture at Pisa University. And during those years, Robin kept developing his bread making skills, leading to him starting to grow small plots of grain crops uh, and getting involved in several participatory research projects of the Italian rural network, Rete Semi Rurali. Robin is currently pursuing a PhD in crop science at WSU Bread Lab under the mentoring of Professor Dr. Stephen S. Jones and exploring the intersections between breeding and baking. Robin's working on the development of a new species of grain uh, that chooses not to die and provides uh, ways to further diversify contemporary farming systems. And at the same time, he's also breeding and selecting wheat varieties with purple or blue seeds for wheat's flavor range and assessing American food sovereignty. So that is quite a background and a ton of interesting stuff. Uh, I'll hand it over to you, Robin. Hey, wonderful. Thank you very much. So just to check, can you hear me? Can you, is yep. it all working? Do you see a presentation? Yep, it looks right. good. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for the fantastic introduction and for uh, for inviting me. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to, to connect with uh, uh, people that do similar work uh, in different regions across all North America. Um, so uh, correct. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about what we what we do at the Brad Lab and um, I think how, how we can um, resonate with with what you're interested into and how we can uh, exchange let's say pieces of reality in one way. Um, so as um, you said, I'm from the northwest coast of Italy and through like some uh, mysterious uh, path, I started uh, working at a restaurant and uh, in Milan, it was a one Michelin star vegetarian restaurant. And so there was so much emphasis on like uh, all the details of uh, cooking and the sourcing of the ingredients and everything was uh, very uh, intense and a lot of dedication. And I learned, I learned a lot about food there for sure. And especially I learned that I really wanted to know where food was coming from. Uh, so I started studying uh, grains and in particular seed production and plant breeding for organic agriculture at the University of Pisa. And then uh, everything came together for me at, at the at the Brad Lab uh, in Washington State. So we're in the uh, very northwest part of the United States. Um, so this is like a overall view of the state. And, and it's interesting because um, there's a lot of wheat growing in uh, Washington state, but the vast majority is in the eastern part. So as you can see from the map, the state is divided by a um, north to south uh, mountainous uh, range that uh, divides the state into two cli climates distinctly uh, different, one very dry on the east side and one uh, particularly moist and uh, rainy and green on the on the west side. We are on the west side, uh, an area called the Skagit Valley that grows about 80 different crops ranging from tulips, potatoes, and of course, wheat and barley and rye. So, um, um, in this area, in 2009, Dr. Stephen Jones founded the, the Bread Lab, uh, developing wheat, uh, barley, and rye varieties uh, dedicated to the uh, growing conditions and needs of the growers uh, of Western Washington and overall the Pacific, uh, the maritime Pacific Northwest. Um, so as you can see already, uh, even like a, a small uh, state like Washington state has different, radically different growing conditions. So anytime we are starting a, a breeding project, we need to consider uh, the different aspects that are essential for the success 
of a particular, let's say, wheat variety. So in terms of climate, we can think of uh, uh, frost-free days and different like rain patterns. In terms of soil, we can talk about different pH and different organic matter content. And in terms of end use, we need to think about, is this wheat variety going to be used for brewing or for baking? And if it's going to be for baking, what kind of baking? Is it going to be um, pastry uh, or uh, is it going to be bread making? And is it going to be using, um, developing, producing refined flour or um, whole grain flour? So all of these factors uh, get summed up into a fundamental concept of plant breeding, which is the, uh, the idiotype. And the, the idiotype uh, is a term that um, contains all, it says basically that um, we are imagining a plant that contains all the traits or presents all the traits that it requires to thrive in a specific environment, while also uh, providing us all, uh, providing us the grain that we need for the specific end use. In essence, the idiotype is telling us that this is the plant of our dreams. And so let's look what that looks like in uh, for wheat, for example. No? So across different wheat types, we have a number of different traits. One that varies significantly, for example, is plant height. No? We can have wheat plants that can be 80 or more centimeters tall, or uh, some very short ones that are like 30 or so. Then we can have wheat plants that have different kinds of uh, spikes. So in this case, we have awns, so those like uh, longer uh, barbs that protrude from the, the seeds. Uh, and then we have onless types, we have compact uh, wheat spikes or even branched one. Um, Similarly, there's a lot of variation also for kernel colors. So there's red wheat varieties, we have purple ones, we can have blue ones or even black ones. Similarly, this type of variation exists also not only in like, um, let's say, traits that we can see with the naked eye, but we also uh, observe like differences and variation inside of the seed. So depending on the different proteins that are accumulated, in the actual flower uh, of the um, that will be derived from the seed, we can have different types of products. So these two um, uh, loaves were um, baked with the same exact recipe, just changing the wheat variety. So on the left hand side, you see the higher loaf volume derives from different types of proteins from what were present in the variety that produced the loaf on the right, which is as a much flatter profile. Um, so let's put together a quick idiotype that I'm gonna be working on after this presentation. So let's say I will want a, a tall plant, let's say 80 centimeters. We want a compact spike uh, and a purple uh, seed color and a low loaf volume because I tend to prefer denser bread. And uh, in order to do so, we, we can consider uh, these different traits as the pieces of the puzzle. So the different traits like spike, morphology, plant height, will have to be sourced from most likely from different plants and brought together through um, hand pollination. Um, and so uh, then selecting for the traits that we want. But let me show you a clearer example. For example, let's say we, we've said that we want to develop a uh, new wheat variety that has a compact head, but has also a purple seed. So we look in our uh, seed bank and all we can find is a, a plant, a variety that has an elongated wheat spike, as you can see on the top left, and a purple seed. Uh, and then on the right hand side, we have a co uh, another wheat variety that has a compact head and a red seed. But we said that we want to have a, a new wheat variety with the compact head and the purple seed. So we need somehow to recombine these traits. Well, we can do it by uh, hand pollen, taking the pollen from one plant and using it to, uh, for fertilizing, uh, to fertilize the other. And boom, there you go. 
Uh, this usually takes a, a bit more time than, than changing a slide, like about three to four years, because we need to uh, look at uh, maybe hundreds or thousands of different individual plants that are all different mixtures of these traits and look for the one that we want. So um, in essence, the wheat breeders in this case are tasked to develop a crop that will respond to both the quantitative and the qualitative demands of the um, wheat industry. On one end, we want to develop varieties that will yield um, a lot, like as much as possible, uh, produce as much grain as possible. And on the other end, we'll also have to produce grain that will be um, good to bake with. You know? So we'll yield flour that will perform well in a bakery context. So from this perspective, we can clearly see that the ideotype itself is not defined by the plant breeder, but actually is defined by the relationships existing between the uh, farmers, the millers, the um, bakers, of course, and the eaters too. So their preferences will um, converge in defining the ideotype and then will task the plant breeder to uh, make that uh, happen in one way or the other. Um, so uh, here uh, comes a, a, a bit of an issue as you start to look closely, more closely um, in a closer fashion to, to these um, relationships and these uh, events. Uh, who defines what uh, quality variety is? No. It clearly depends. Are we talking about uh, quality in the field? So that could be grain yield, which is the product of disease resistance, lodging resistance. Um, let's say the length of the life cycle, many, many aspects, or are we talking about quality in the bakery, which could be something like water absorption, dose strength, and many other traits that overall tend to be uh, pretty much um, coalesce and, and focus on, on few um, common traits that are common worldwide in, in wheat breeding. So if these are the uh, possible um, ideotypes, we subsample it. And then these tend to uh, uh, revolve around few traits, which are, as we said, grain yield, and then refined flour yield, which is how much flour, refined white flour are we going to get from a kilogram of wheat? high protein content, mainly for uh, bread making and so producing like a high loaf volume, and then flower color that has to be always white. Uh, so uh, just to provide a practical connection to, uh, to this concept, this is a, a flour mill that, um, um, a laboratory scale flour mill that replicates a commercial uh, flour mill um, machine. No? Um, so um, if you follow the, the, the yellow arrows here, indicate the path that a, a single kernel of wheat will have to follow to, to get turned into flour. So the, this machine was specifically a uh, device to produce um, a refined flour because it facilitates the separation between the bran and the endosperm. So the outer part of the seed and internal part of the seed. So um, once it has gone through these um, pairs of cylinders, the seed is actually turned into whole grain flour, but then it goes through a final uh, passage, a final process of sifting through a tumbler system that will separate on one end, on the left hand side, bran and germ from the right hand side, which where we have the refined white flour. So this is a, a very um, efficient, very effective mechanism, um, happens worldwide and has been happening for centuries. Um, to, and what, what we can uh, reflect on is based on just this simple picture is that on the right hand side we have um, the um, we have the refined flour which con is mainly composed out of starch and gluten and so provides really the technological qualities that we all associate with wheat so the capability of developing a dough and then inflating thanks to the yeast and retaining that volume and being baked in a soft and fluffy loaf. Uh, whereas on the left-hand side, we have the bran, which um, 
contains uh, is mainly com composed of like proteins there's some lipids from the germ and um, minerals zinc and iron vitamins of different kinds vitamin of the b group vitamin e and of course dietary fiber so already we are uh, comparing two very different fractions you not know, from the very same um, derived from the very same source which is the wheat kernel uh, clearly, these will have a very um, different um, function and impact from a nutritional perspective, and, and we'll get that into that very soon. But first, I want to reflect on one final thing. Um, from a quantitative perspective, the drawer on the left-hand side represents up to 30% of the wheat kernel, or if we want to say it in a different way, 30% of the entire food output of uh, any acre of, um, of wheat. So it's important to consider when uh, we are uh, choosing as a society or as an industry to focus only on the production of refined flour, we're actually in one way or the other discarding or rejecting about 30% of wheat production. Uh, of the production of wheat kernels. Uh, and, and that's uh, not as a small amount for any uh, mean. No? So um, what we can see here, considering that the um, wheat industry, and I'm thinking about mainly the, the wheat industry in the United States, but it's fairly similar in many ways from this perspective to Canadian, to the Canadian wheat industry or the European wheat industry too, there's a substantial divergence between what the market is uh, um, promoting and, and telling and the nutritional needs of the people. And uh, we can see what that looks like here. This is a study that um, measured and um, reviewed the um, impact of a suboptimal of diet on the um, on human health substantially what the researchers found was that a suboptimal diet uh, is a major risk um, health risk um, across basically 200 countries and um, um below, from all all the continents on the planet and uh, finding out that uh, factors like low whole grain consumption negatively affected um, human health in a way comparable or higher than smoking tobacco or other, uh, let's say, behavioral components of health. Um, this reflection and so the fact that a diet low in dietary fiber causes uh, a number of uh, negative consequences on human health was um, also confirmed a number of times from the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, which is a publication that provides general indications of what a good diet should be in the United States. And uh, this publication since 2005 have been, has been suggesting that uh, people should be eating at least 14 grams of dietary fiber every 1,000 calories. Uh, however, this is the most recent edition of this document, and still they have been able to measure that, uh, to verify that at least 90% of the population of the United States does not meet this uh, recommended dietary fiber intake, with negative consequences on non-communicable diseases ranging from cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, and, and similar um, issues. Um, However, so this from a from a public health perspective, but uh, it's interesting to observe that uh, the priori prioritization of uh, refined flour production from a um, let's say baking milling, but also from a breeding perspective, as a negative consequence on public health, but also on other aspects of wheat production and environmental health. This is a um, scientific paper from a group of researchers from the University of Saskatchewan, which uh, we are working on a very ambitious project, which was of that of um, transferring the genetic resistance to a common wheat disease called leaf rust from a, a wild plant, uh, which is related to wheat, to domesticated wheat. Uh, so, um, and they were able to achieve 
uh, this uh, this goal. Of the, um, and so they were able to develop with varieties that were genetically resistant to the disease and did not require um, any uh, fungicide, for example, to deal with that specific disease. However, when they transferred uh, through just cross-pollination, so there was no GMO uh, implied in this process, um, when they were able, when they transferred these uh, sets of genes from the wild relative to um, the domesticated wheat, they also transferred genes that were affecting the flower color, turning it from white to yellow, which is a marvelous yellow. If any of you have, have seen like durum flower or semolina, you can relate to that. It's like a, it's a pleasant uh, trait. I have a cooking background, so I kind of appreciate these things too. However, as they, um, the researchers specified, they underlined the fact that yes, they were able to develop wheat varieties that, or wheat plants that were uh, resistant to the disease, but this trait was not possible to use, to be used in a, a wheat breeding context because the trait itself would affect in an undesirable way the flower color. So in, in essence, what we can say is that from a cultural perspective, the flower whiteness has, is prioritized over uh, human health because um, we get rid of the, diet of the, of the dietary fiber um, in order to have these fluffy white um, high volume loaves and is prioritized over also environmental health because it's more acceptable to have farmers having to spray fungicide than um, to lose the flower whiteness. So um, in, in this sense, this is a, a quick scheme of what the relationship in, uh, um, in the wheat industry are. So we have a, um, all this relationship between farmers and plant breeders and millers and bakers are, and, and eaters, of course, are pretty circular no? and they uh, function according to the relationship of um, offer and demand. And so one influences the other as kind of a chicken and the egg situation where it seems like change cannot happen. However, uh, plant breeders have the agency and the tools and the opportunities to develop new types of wheat and hence offer alternatives. And, and this is what we have been doing at the, at the Brad Lab. So if um, the vast majority, if not the entire commercial production of wheat worldwide is based on white and red wheat, well, the biological diversity of wheat offers more than that. And so we have started wor working on developing blue, purple, black um, wheat varieties. And we use this as a way to further underline the importance and the value of whole grain consumption. Because interestingly enough, the pigments are located in the bran fraction, not in the flour. And so if you want the pigments, you need to use the whole grain flour which contributes to flavor, which contributes to nutrition and, and all of those marvelous things. So we as plant breeders can offer an alternative and generate, um, let's say, a way to satisfy the interest of bakers that can't wait to, to try new things, to develop new products. And, and of course, there's a lot of enthusiasm around food now and people are interested in trying something else. However, we need to overcome some assumption because like bread is a staple um, food and uh, sometimes people tend to be very attached to that sense of familiarity with a very specific type of bread, a very specific sets of features. And so um, challenging that familiarity can at times be uh, be complicated. So here I just want to uh, introduce like our uh, let's say plan, uh, participatory plant breeding um, work. And we uh, have been profoundly inspired by uh, these two people, which is on the left hand side, Salvatore Ceccarelli, and on the right hand side, Stefania Grando. And they have been um, spearheading and really um, they, they all the work on evolutionary plant breeding and participatory plant breeding throughout um, their research activities in the Middle East and now uh, in, in Europe. And I really encourage you to, to read any of their uh, publications that has um, really 
inspiring and helpful in conducting this work. Um, here, uh, I want to focus on, on our, like, let's say, the agronomic side of what we do. No? So, um, as I mentioned, the Brad Lab is located in an area that is a um, very um, diverse cropping system. So, uh, differently from many other parts, for example, the eastern side of the state, um, it's not an area devoted just to wheat production. No? Um, so, farmers have different needs. Um, for example, one thing that um, farmers asked Dr. Jones when he moved here was to develop varieties that would allow them to uh, grow wheat that would function well in their crop rotation. And in particular, considering that one of the major uh, crops in the area are potatoes, they wanted uh, by, uh, to, to produce wheat that, yes, had high grain yields, but also that produced a lot of biomass that could be converted eventually to organic matter to turn back into the soil and support their, um, their practices because uh, potato farming is quite demanding on, um, on soils, in soils in terms of tillage. So in this picture, you see on the left-hand side, a uh, common um, wheat variety and uh, that um, is highly appreciated from a baking perspective. Um, because um, it yields a really uh, strong dough and high low volume and all of that. And it's kind of well known in the, in the baking world here in the US. And on the right hand side, you see um, a population called Skagit 1109 that was developed at the Brad Lab. So first difference is like the plant height. Uh, on the left hand side, we are talking about a plant that is between 50 and 60 centimeters tall. And on the right hand side, we are talking about a plant that is between 80 and 90, maybe even a meter um, um, tall, uh, cent under centimeter tall. And so uh, farmers wanted, a, yes, a tall plant, but that didn't lodge. And so we had to select for that. Then um, Western Washington is a fantastic site for the uh, growth and development of a major wheat disease, which is called stripe rust. So as you can see on the left hand side, uh, the, that variety has been really hammered by stripe rust. All the leaves are yellow and kind of don't look too promising. Whereas on the right hand side, so same place, same situation, same environmental conditions, the variety that was selected here to address and be resistant to that pathogen is doing just fine. All the plants are uh, green. And if you see some variation is because there's a, it's a population and so some plants are more resistant than others but overall the whole population looks pretty good um this is a, another um example of uh, this is a um, the man in in the wheat is uh, keith kisler which is a farmer that we the bread lab has been working on for the last uh 10 years and uh, um growing um, on the Olympic Peninsula, so even wet, more west than where we are, uh, definitely not in the American wheat belt, uh, but still they were able to develop a, um, an integrated operation where they are growing um, wheat, uh, milling it. Uh, this is a, a flour stone mill built by a company in Vermont. And um, uh, and then also produce whole grain flour to sell uh, locally. And now even they have a, even a, a bakery. Uh, in this way, they've been able locally to um, address um, this issue and, and, and kind of uh, move from theory to practice. So this is a, a chart from a paper from the 70s. And it's since then that we know that whole grain um, flour is a... Um, is a more valuable, let's say, has a higher nutritional value than refined flour. As you look, take a look at this um, at this chart, you see that the more we remove the bran uh, out of the um, wheat kernel, the more nutrients we lose: so vitamins, proteins, lipids, and fiber. So, uh, in a very localized sense, we have been working with farmers uh, that um, were able to uh, both. Uh, develop their own, uh, let's say, 
improve their crop crop rotation or uh, also um, develop all the entire new operations centered around the uh, local supply of, of wheat. However, uh, in a broader sense, we also partnered with uh, King Arthur Baking Company. King Arthur is uh, uh, one of the oldest flower companies in the US and has been a partner of the Bread Lab for since 2009. And um, they have uh, liked the Bread Lab because of um, its intention and its uh, um, desire to be uh, different, to offer an alternative to uh, what's usually uh, available. And in particular, at the, at the very end of 2023, uh, King Arthur released in, in collaboration with the Bread Lab this new flower product that is available nationwide. And, and so in this way, we can, um, let's say, still promote this whole idea of um, eating and producing and breeding for whole grain uh, consumption and whole grain uh, wheat systems, you know. So going from a very localized scale to a nationwide scale. So to conclude, um, I would say that uh, participatory breeding is a, a process that um, in its essence allows us to um, gain uh, agency us in terms of communities. So we are talking about uh, the whole range of, of people. So plant breeders, um, farmers, bakers, millers, and eaters, and um, reflect and reflect on the fact that is this system working? You know, in, in particular, so from an environmental perspective, from a public health perspective, and what are the assumptions that we are dealing with? For example, a lot of people would say, well, flour has to be white. And so anything that deviates from that is a problem. And so you can clearly understand that that's a bit of a, a issue and a limiting factor if we want to develop something else, something new. So. Um, or, for example, even ideas like you cannot grow wheat for bread making in a certain area, like it was the case here in Western Washington. Well, actually, uh, you can if you uh, connect with people that are interested in doing it and, and enable them through developing varieties that can do that, it's possible. So in this way, as in a very like system-wide perspective, we can, um, with simple acts like developing wheat varieties that can do certain things, that can enable certain systems, address uh, environmental and public health issues from a local scale to nationwide scale. And thank you very much for, for inviting me. I, I really appreciated this opportunity and to connect with all of you. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you, Robin. It's just fascinating. Um, so we have quite a bit of time for discussion now. We got about 20 minutes. We were wondering, uh, Robin, how much of a balancing act do you find there is between trying to choose whether to go for agronomic traits or traits for the eating, milling, uh, and baking side of it? And how do you balance that? Yeah, so, so um, generally we, we start from the field. So a variety has to first, or let's say a breeding line or a new type of wheat has to work first in the field, in the sense that it has to be resistant to diseases, it has to um, be um, yielding, um, it has to be high yielding and um, work for the farmers. No. Among uh, those, uh, we then select for, um, let's say, baking quality and use quality. And uh, um, in, the, in that way, kind of narrow um, the selection from um, to, to, to those that like actually are um, functionally functional uh, functionally perform well, so in terms of dough, but also that taste good, you know, uh, because a, a big uh, assumption around uh, whole grain is that in one way or the other you have to renounce to to something. Okay, whole grain is good for you, but it tastes bad. Whole grain is good for you, but it cannot doesn't make good bread. Like it's kind of flat or like a little 
weird in some way or the other, but actually all of those things can be selected for. So we can develop varieties that actually function well, function well um, as a plant and then as a food and then as a whole grain food, we can say. You know? So for example, here at the lab, there was a, as a kind of a, um, ex like pretty uh, charged, let's say, example. Um, uh, Steve Jones collaborated with uh, uh, Jeff Yankelo, which is a um, fantastic baker here from the from the US, and they focused on developing a whole wheat croissant, you know, uh, which seemed like a, um, almost a imp impossible thing, and um, just to show that actually, if you uh, match the right variety with the right process and and the right artist, they would say you can do it, you no. Know? Uh, and so um, that we can overcome all of these assumptions. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, Michelle, did you can I ask a question? Yeah, and then we've got one in the chat. Um, I was just wondering how these baker researcher collaborations start. Is it the baking industry that's contacting your lab or is it the other way around like how do those start um it goes a bit both both ways depending on the on, on the relationship you no know? uh, um there has to be like a um a mutual mutual interest and mutual uh, connection like uh, for example for us like working on um whole grain products is like really essential for all the reasons that, that I mentioned. And so um, it has to be, that that has to be a perspective that is shared by the other um, collaborators too, for example. And, and so it's mainly about like um, having some common ground, you know, I would say. Um, yeah, and, and interestingly enough, like, uh, um, in many cases, like bringing change to um, operations involved in the wheat industry is fairly complex for, for many reasons, uh, involving tradition in uh, um, tight margin from a financial perspective. Um, however, there's like a mounting evidence that it's important to try to move in that direction from a many reasons ranging from environmental to public health yeah that's a great question thank you uh we've got a couple questions in the chat and then one from robert yeah. uh so evan is asking how was the purple wheat received by bread consumers about taste color uh and what is the purple wheat percentage in each of the loaves um, yeah, so um, we we can go like no no problem like one hundred percent purple wheat like whole grain purple wheat, and um, it, it works uh, totally fine. Uh, people really like it uh, from a flavor perspective in particular. Um, we don't have like uh, necessarily like a detailed explanation for why that's the case, but like um, my like general intuition would tell tells me that, for example, um, the purple pigments that make wheat purple are anthocyanins, which are polyphenols, one, one, one of the numerous classes of polyphenols. And um, I imagine that they um, those have some kind of an effect on flavor. Similarly to what happens in red wine, uh, polyphenols compose much of the body of uh, the red wine flavor. We can imagine that polyphenols that go through a fermentation process in wheat might have something to do with that. No, but definitely when you taste this uh, purple wheat, uh, you, you taste that there's something else going on. And I'm talking about sourdough uh, bread in particular that kind of makes the flavor really pop up. Um, yeah, so the, the reception from consumers, good, I would say. Yeah, they, they not, nobody was um, uh, challenged or scared <laughs> or, yeah. That's good to hear. 
Yeah, sometimes uh sometimes it takes a little to get get the eaters to be adventurous. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And um the, the, the interesting thing for, from from a let's say conceptual perspective is that uh, many times that um people have had the opportunity to to taste the bread that we, we make here, they they weren't like triggered to ask, is this whole grain or not? They just liked it. You know? And and so then then we talked about the fact that it was all grain, no. But so it wasn't like um, evident, no, to them. It was just good, no? <laughs> Like, huh? That's really cool. That's great. Yeah. Uh, we have another question in the chat from Xavier. Are participants in the seed breeding program allowed to save and regrow their seed? And how is infield cross pollination managed or accounted for and observed in subsequent generations? Um, yeah, so um, so yes, uh, the the farmers are allowed to regrow uh, the um, the populations that they have been growing. Uh, for example, um, Keith uh, Kiesler on on the example I I, I provided um, on his farm, he, they they grow uh, their own seed. Uh, so yes, they they do that um, freely, and um, so. The cross pollination. So wheat um, is a self pollinator. There's like a very slim um, chance that it will cross pollinate. So when we have our um, let's say um, field trials, and we want um, we we don't really need to st stress about cross pollination in that case because. Um, even just having plots separated from one from the other is enough to not have to, to worry about that. Um, whereas uh, thinking about like diverse populations, actually cross pollination might be even seen as a good thing because it just keeps uh, remixing all these different traits. Uh, so some people, um, I remember reading a, a paper on this, they were even um, suggesting the idea of deliberately inserting some male sterile um, wheat plants in the population so they were they would be forced to cross pollinate and kind of continue this like remixing of um, uh, traits. Um, yeah, so so yeah. Uh, so could I ask, what generation are the populations that you are testing them at? Yeah, so um, yeah, so Schedule 11 or 9 was released in 09. Uh, so um, it's probably like at this point F15, something like that. Uh, but at what point did you stop selecting? Like, that makes sense. Or did you, was it like a mass selection, natural selection? Yeah, so um, so we the 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 main the main thing that was was done, and this was before my time, was um, like um, just basically regrowing the bulk population for several years, and then um, snapping around like two thousand um, heads, and then growing them as head rows, and then. So just to provide like a more uh, accurate screening for like things like stress and um, rust um, susceptibility. So removing all the susceptible individuals. And so then moving on with the fairly broad um, population that included many different uh, individuals, uh, but that had some commonalities like Stripe, stripe resist, uh, stripe rust resistance, and like uh, uh, maturity, and, and all of those things. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, just to give everyone a, um, an idea of the populations that we're dealing with in the Canadian PBB program, um, the uh, so each when we say F one, it means by generation. So each time that population is grown out. And from the third year that that population was grown out to the sixth year, the farmers were selecting three to 500 spikes each year, saving that seed and then planting it again the following year. So that was three years of um, more diverse selection than a normal breeding program. Uh, and so at the F6 stage, it's generally accepted that you're not gonna have a lot of cross pollination or any um, 
uh, changes in the individual spikes, but the popu when we say population, it means the individual plants within that bulk are different from each other, but the actual spike will not change that much because as Robin said, it, it's they're self-pollinated. So you might have about like, I don't know, I was like, well, 2%, 3% um, bit of diversity from that point on, but uh, just for everyone to just understand in terms of the populations that we deal with in the Canadian program. Very good to know, thank you. Uh, Robert is up next, he has his hand up. My mic is on, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for your presentation. That's very uh, enlightening. Uh, I just need to react to a few of your comments and and uh, statements where, you know, we, we tend to speak of the bread industry or the milling industry. <laughs> and what we're seeing is now more of a, how could I say, these, the, these industries are segmenting uh, progressively. And it's probably a East Coast, West Coast phenomenon, whereas the center of uh, America is still into volume design for export. So we are seeing some trends where uh, here in the East Coast and in, in Eastern Canada, uh, these programs are, are moving quite uh, comfortably. I mean, we're, we've started our own processing of, of local wheat and adapting wheats from uh, about 1,500 tons about 15 years ago to uh, getting close to about 100,000 tons of, of milling wheat of high quality of different varieties, different breeds. And we're also bringing the consumer base into a much more variety of nutritional quality, of baking quality. And you will see probably, and this is not just the East Coast, West Coast, but the uh, walk into the supermarket and the bread section in the past 10 years has tremendously exploded uh, in terms of variety of products, in terms of uh, uh, migratory flux of where do you come from? What kind of wheat do you, uh, what kind of bread do you eat? So it's, it's evolving at a certain comfortable level. Uh, so I, I think we, we need to, uh, to assist this by developing programs such as your own, but also trying to see how they can adapt into the milling and distribution. One of the issues that we've encountered in most of our breeding programs is whatever I think I can't, you know, or whatever I can think of nutrition, I can't force the horse to drink water. Uh, um, it, it, it product has to be good, has to be genuine, has to be cost affordable. And this is where the whole issue of, uh, in the breeding programs, keeping an, an eye on yield, keeping an, an eye on how much this could benefit to the farmer. Uh, not just, you, you can't just breed in certain qualities. You have to sell this quality at a certain level and a certain volume because you have a certain limited volume of one type of wheat. If you have a crop failure, your business is in dire problems. So uh, we're looking at it as a broader perspective of building larger programs to, to meet this, uh, these needs. So thank you, it was a good presentation. Wonderful, yeah. Yeah, uh, no, thank you. Thank you for, the, for your contribution. I, um, I think any any effort no, in like trying to promote and like develop uh, like an, an alternative in another direction, let's say considering all the different elements that go into the, the system is, is is wonderful, yeah. I, I I didn't want to to come across as like lumping everything into one um, one bucket, no. But um, from a like an overall perspective, like here in the U.S., about like ninety five percent of the flour produced yearly is like refined flour. So so that's that's a lot, like a lot of imbalance. And uh, but even in within this refined. Flour, you know, you could push it from 70% up to 80%. Mm -hmm. uh, your mention of uh, yellow quality flour, 
we've pushed our volumes up to about 40% of our, the wheats that we're breeding now are into this yellow quality, specifically because of resistance to, uh, to uh, mycotoxins and other uh, agronomic uh, uh, problems. So it breeds in and there's a certain appreciation of a yellowish artisan color, even for a refined flower. Wonderful, yeah. Well, thank you for those comments. It is important to consider that whole value chain. And it's exciting to see that there is a lot more progress being made in the diversity and different things being offered. Um, we did have a question, just a quick clarification in the chat. Um, can you explain the difference between a variety and a population for those just getting into kind of land race and on-farm breeding? Yeah, wonderful. Would, would uh, Michelle, would you, would you like to to do it since you are like really? Oh, sure, I could do it. Um, so uh, a variety, uh, as you can see, Rob and I have been very careful to call varieties, populations, or genotypes because a variety is a registered, is is actually registered. And so I don't know if it's the same in in the states, but in Canada, um, it is uh, registered with Agriculture and Agri Food Canada. Um, and it had gone through the registration process, whereas the populations that we work with, they're pretty diverse and they're not registered with agri agriculture and agri-food Canada. And so uh, we're very careful with our terminology. So we can say genotypes, we can say populations, we can say lines, but cultivar variety, it denotes a certain amount of, um, yeah, involvement with the government and regulatory bodies. And also it is um, genetically the same. And so in a breeding program at, uh, you know, the uh, fourth generation of growing something out, you will take a single spike and you will plant that single spike singular um, and we'll call that a head row. And so Robin, had mentioned a head row. And then those plants that come out of that spike are genetically the same. And then a breeder will evaluate all of the head rows individually, and then they will eliminate certain head rows. And so then if a head row looks really good, that genetically similar head row will just be selected. And then that line in a breeding program will be progressed. Um, and so if you look out into conventional wheat or the wheat that you grow, that you see across the landscape, that the heights are the same, the, the ons are the same height, the color, everything is very, very similar and uniform. Um, and it's because every single plant out there is genetically the same. Whereas we work in populations where you'll see in some of my pictures and I'm sure in, in um, Robin's lab's program that you'll have different heights, the bonds will be at different sizes, different colors. And so the plants themselves are genetically diverse, different from each other, um, but the seeds within that spike will be the same. So that's why we're very careful about population versus cultivar. And then for land race, I should say, a land race is something that has been grown um, culturally over time. That's not necessarily registered with um, agriculture and agri-food Canada, but it is a recognized um, cultivar because it has certain characteristics that make it distinct from other uh, genotypes. So uh, that's why we call some things land races. So for example, red fife is a Canadian land race, even though it originated in Ukraine, but it's been growing in Canada since 1886. And so we would call that a land race. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, big, big thank you to both of our speakers today, Michelle and Robin, you guys were awesome. We also will have a couple more resources coming out that this group might be interested in. Um, there is a current review process on Canada's sea regulations, uh, and this will be a significant overhaul of them. It's been ongoing for a little while, and this is the, I think, second round of consultations is open right now. Uh, and this change to the regulations could have really significant impacts on producers, especially anybody who's certified organic. Uh, so the National Farmers Union is working on a guide to make it easier for all of us to understand 
the implications of those proposed changes, uh, as well as how to read through that feedback survey, and they're offering some options for how to respond to those questions. Um, so if you are at all interested in seed sovereignty and farmers' rights around seed breeding, uh, speaking up in these consultations is one of the most important things that you can do right now to push for stronger regulations that better support farmers' rights and seed sovereignty. So please keep this on your radar and send in your input. Um, we will be helping share that resource over the next couple of weeks. Uh, so keep an eye out for it. And then lastly, a teaser for um, some really cool uh, work coming out of another grad student uh, at the U of M. Uh, Murray Jowett has done a study on value chains for PPB in Canada. Uh, and the BOTA team is putting together a research summary on that. So that'll be out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and if you're interested in getting a copy of that or the NFU's guide for the seed regulation consultations, uh, send me an email. I would love to hear from you uh, and I will try and make sure that you get those things. Uh, and you'll also hear from us again uh, in a couple, a few days once, once the recording is ready. Um, yeah, and I think, uh, I think that's everything for today. So really big thank you to everybody. Uh, this was a super cool, super cool discussion and presentations. Uh, very exciting.